Danny. Good afternoon. Is everybody still awake? Yeah. Excellent. I'm Jonathan Smear. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you all this afternoon about how to lead customer centricity, the critical role that you all play in that, but also talk also about how you can help your executives help take the whole organization on that journey or avoid losing that culture of centricity, customer centricity that you may already have. So some of you may feel as though you already work for organizations that are very cust customer centric. But uh, as I've experienced, I've been in uh, custom organizations that do customer centricity really well. I'll talk about those today. Uh, but I've been in organizations that as they've scaled, they've lost that focus. They've lost that innovation and agility. So I start with a little bit about my background. You know, I haven't, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm not a career consultant, uh, but most of my background is in business transformation and change, uh, particularly culture change. Uh, and that's not by, uh, by uh, something I was seeking, but it just sort of happened to me that I was in the center of a lot of change in the different roles I had. Most of my career, I've had senior financial leadership roles, CFO roles, strategy roles in companies such as uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, Madge Networks in the Americas, um, Cisco Systems, I was at Cisco for over 20 years, holding roles such as the EMEA Corporate Controller, the CFO for the uh, emerging markets business that we scaled over six years. We scaled it from about 1.7 billion in 130 countries to five and a half billion. So that was all about scaling and a lot of that was driven by culture. Uh, I joined Amazon Web Services not to do another finance role or strategy role, but they were putting together what they call the enterprise transformation team because as you know, Amazon Web Services sort of came out of Amazon's IT. They started offering those capabilities to customers. A lot of them initially were the digital natives, the startups, et cetera. I think over 85% of the digital natives developed and scaled with Amazon. And it includes the likes of Uber, Airbnb, Netflix. As Amazon approached selling to the enterprise, figuring out how can we help, if you like, the more traditional enterprises, the, not the startups, initially selling into IT organizations at you know, a couple of levels down probably from the CIO, uh, they then realized they needed to sort of elevate the conversation and help customers understand how their technology could enable their business strategy. So that was why we were put together as a team. It was four ex-CIOs and myself, and we were engaged really to sort of help executives understand how Amazon and the way that it worked could enable their business strategy. So having worked closely with customers in more of an evangelist role and speaking at conferences like this, I then joined Digital Works Group about uh, 18 months ago to work more closely with customers on their transformation journeys. And I'll talk about that a little bit today. So I've always been very passionate about change. I've always enjoyed change. Uh, my old CEO at Cisco used to say, uh, change is great as long as you're the one driving it. And I think that's probably how most people feel, isn't it? My other great passion is cars and racing cars, and that's a picture of me racing an old Austin Healey at Spa. So in today's talk, I've sort of broken it into three pieces. I'd like to talk first about Amazon's journey, because I think they're a great example of a customer-centric organization that has managed to scale without losing its focus on customer centricity and its focus on innovation, and has remained very agile. So I'll use that as a great example to start off with. Then talk about other organizations that, and the ways they work, as well as why you know, everybody today is talking about customer centricity but they really struggle to change. You know, I mean, with lots of customers, oh yes, this is a really important change we need to make. We need to be more customer-centric, more innovative. Just doesn't happen. So I'll talk about why that is. And then bring it all home at the end, uh, talking about 
the role you can play from wherever you sit in your organization, helping maintain that customer centricity in your organization and champion it, but more importantly, how you can help the organization above you remain focused on customer centricity and avoid losing that focus on the customer. So starting with Amazon, Amazon's mission from the very beginning was to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. And what they set, continually talk about in Amazon is how do we keep raising the bar on the customer experience? And one of my favorite quotes from uh, Mr. Bezos is that in today's era of volatility, and we've certainly seen more than our fair share in the last three years, you have to reinvent, and you have to reinvent continually. And that agility is the only sustainable competitive advantage you can have. So you might be first to market with the best product, but other people can replicate it and catch you. So how do you stay ahead? And as a culture, Amazon, in every business it goes into, in every market it goes into, tries to get to market very quickly, get the customer experience, and then keep iterating and reinventing with customers. And that's a massive piece of the culture at Amazon that I discovered when I joined them. And uh, in many ways, it was a revelation to me. I'd been in Cisco when it was 4 billion and 4,000 employees. We were all about swarming around customers. We'd be talking to customers. We'd be pulling R&D people in from California. And we really felt we were very customer-centric, and we were reinventing with customers at that point. As we scaled, we lost that agility and, and tried to maintain some of it by acquiring 200 companies to bring in new technology, but often got the feedback we were difficult to deal with and not customer-centric. So the big thing that drives Amazon, much more, I would say, than strategy, um, is the culture. The culture is um, all about customer obsession. That's the primary leadership principle. There are 13 others, such as earning trust, bias for action, et cetera. Well worth looking up. But that culture is something they obsessively protect. I joined Amazon Web Services in um, September 2018. 750,000 employees in that organization at that point. Leaving it two and a half years later, it doubled. And so Amazon takes great pains to preserve the culture and avoid it being diluted by bringing lots of new hires in as it grows its business. It views hiring as one of the key mechanisms to protect its culture. The hiring process into Amazon uh, is called the loop. It's the most rigorous process I've ever seen for recruitment. It isn't, here you can have 14 interviews, but they're all basically the same. They're all actually very different. Testing the candidate to see if they've, they, there's data to support that they exhibit 10 of the 14 leadership principles. And if, and five managers are typically involved, including the hiring manager, with a bar raiser to moderate it. If the hiring manager is inclined, but the other managers are not inclined to hire that person. The person doesn't get hired because they're hiring talent for Amazon's organization, not for that particular role. So they talk about hiring and developing builders who know what to do, not because they're told, but because their behavior is expected to conform to the leadership principles. And that is really how Amazon goes into every business. As I say, they, they view getting to market quickly to test the experience with customers. And you can see that if, you, if you've been into any of the Amazon Go stores where they're using what they call just walk out technology. You can tap your phone. It knows who you are. It observes what you do in that store. As you leave, it sends you a bill. So it's just, you know, they're constantly trying to reinvent the customer experience, make it more frictionless. In that case, it's a, phys it's a sort of physical experience of walking into a store and taking something. They're constantly trying to bring down the time between you clicking on Amazon's site and receiving the goods at your door. They're, they're, they're experimenting with drones and those small trucks. Amazon Web Services came out of the, the need to 
support Amazon itself by reinventing. Bezos asked Mr. Um, uh, Jeff Bezos asked his uh, successor, Andy Jassy, you've got to figure out how we can make IT keep up with our businesses. And that's what became Amazon Web Services, and they're continually bringing out new products for customers. And Bezos himself talks a lot about investing in failure. People may remember the Fire Phone. I think that's their biggest failure. But they talk all the time, and it was quite a revelation to me to be told that, you know, we expect failure. Uh, not everything is going to work. If every experiment works, it's not an experiment. So we expect failure, but we want to fail fast, at low cost, and iterate. And that's a massive, uh, that's quite a difficult concept when I think about the companies I've worked with where nobody ever failed, nobody lost a deal, products always were perfect, so they lost that opportunity to reinvent it with their customers. So having talked about Amazon and how they've preserved their culture, which they've had from day one, and, and that day one culture Jeff Bezos talks about all the time, is behaving like a startup, and many people talk about um, Amazon being a thousand startups. And that day one culture, they're trying to avoid becoming a day two culture where you lose the innovation and the centricity on customers. But there are reasons why other organizations have been successful, but before we talk about those, I think it's important to talk about lots of people want to be much more customer-centric. Why do they struggle? If you think about a lot of the large organizations that we have today, the, some people call them legacy enterprises, although I don't think that's very flattering, you know, they were designed to scale with stability and predictability. They saw competitive advantage in building a massive brand and scaling the organization and competing on that basis. People would feel safe with that large organization and that brand. Big focus on operational excellence, on business as usual. Big focus on efficiency. Big focus on cost. Organized into a functional structure. The problem with that is, as I observed at Cisco and, I've seen, and, I, and a lot of the customers I talk to is the focus on the customer is lost. The strategy is developed a long way from the customer. They also lack the capacity to change. And when they do need to change because there's, been, there's a sort of burning platform, they tend to think of it as a, like a once in a lifetime change. We'll change and then we can go back to our ways of business as usual, of operational excellence. So they usually have a low frequency of change, and they might do a five-year transformation. And they bring in a big consultancy like a McKinsey or a Deloitte. Now, you contrast that to what are the, a lot of the organizations that we've seen be successful through COVID, is they have a much higher frequency, but of much smaller changes. They're not doing a five-year plan and then sticking rigidly to it, probably spending a year developing it. If you think about people who might have developed a five-year plan two or three years ago, hasn't the world changed? So you see in these new ways of working, different work cultures, new work cultures, big focus on innovation, organizing for change, having the capacity to change, organizing into cross-functional teams, you know, breaking down the silos, behaving as a startup. And the other thing I observe is that many of them don't try to drive everything to perfection. So they're not trying to be outstanding in finance and HR and all the support functions. They focus on the thing that really differentiates them with their customers. And then they say, well, I know we've always delivered our own products. It's not a differentiator. Let's get somebody else to do it. So they build partnerships, and they have to get good at building partnerships and ecosystems, because many of them have been burnt by outsourcing. They might outsource their IT. They might put everything in the cloud so they can focus on the customer experience. Some great examples of how customer experience can be disrupted and how markets can be changed forever, and customer expectations can be reset forever talked about Amazon, um, but another 
more traditional organization is Capital One. They're trying to reinvent banking. If you think of the turmoil in financial services and how that's all changing, Capital One is trying to be a leader in helping reinvent banking. The example I most like is Zara. If you think about most clothes retailers, they design a line for a season, let's say it's spring, they get it made in factories, they stock it, and they hope that snapshot of what a customer wants to experience buying their clothes is good for that season. They'll expect to sell some of it out in a sale, and then they'll bring in the summer or autumn or fall or whatever you want to call it, season. Many of them don't even realize how Zara operates. Um, but the way Zara operates is they don't do seasons. Every two weeks, they're iterating their lines. As the lines reach the stores, they put a big focus on collecting feedback on what customers like and don't like, fed back to the designers who can then iterate the lines that can be out there very quickly. And that's really one of the reasons they're so successful. Think about how you can connect customers to experiences as, as we've seen with Ubers and Airbnbs. All Uber does is connect empty cars with riders and Airbnb connects travelers with empty rooms without needing all that infrastructure. And look how they've disrupted the market. I don't think technology always has to be part of transformation. In fact, I talk to many customers who've bought lots of technology and think, hey, we've invested in all this technology. We're not seeing the results, the outcomes. The investments aren't paying off. But it certainly makes a difference. It can really reduce the latency. You, know, you want data-driven decisions, so you want data everywhere. You want to democratize it so that people can get the data they need to do their job. That gives them the insight that either drives operational excellence or drives uh, or helps. It informs their strategy. You know, what are the customer experience trends we need to be thinking of? But with that insight, you have to be able to move quickly. So they need to be able to reinvent quickly, and you need fast execution. A great example, in my mind, is what Epic Games did with Fortnite. They're constantly feeding back gamer experience to designers who iterate the game all the time. They don't have release one and a couple of years later release two. They evolve the game, the features, the functionality, and what you can do in it, the gamer experience, continually. And as a result, it's been one of the most successful games in the world, over a quarter of a billion people playing it. So we've talked a little bit about Amazon. We've talked about the customer-centric organization. How can you help your organization be customer-centric? I'm sure none of you need to be, to be told about how important it is to be customer-centric. But how do you help take the rest of the organization you're part of on the journey? How do you help the leaders lead? Because many of them struggle with where to start. The challenge is how to evolve your operating model and culture. Because you know the, 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 the sort of more traditional organizations, they have that focus of operational excellence. They're very much driven from the top down down through the silos. IT can often off, be off to the side, but it's all about predictability and stability. Now, I don't think you should try and abandon all that, but you've also got to find ways to become more agile and become more innovative. And the, the critical thing for the execs to understand is although they need to lead it and sponsor it, they've also got to get out of the way of it. Because really, the place to be reinventing with customers is the people who work closely with customers. Those small, self-empowered, cross-functional teams, often with tech teams sitting with them, that are continually changing the customer experience. You know, they're getting insights from data. That's informing what they should do next. And then working in fast, iterative sprints. And when I talk to business leaders, I say, you know, don't do a massive transformation program. Start with a few sprints to learn how to do this, to develop this as competency, and then figure out 
how to scale it. So, to, to bring this all home, this is my last slide. Uh, how can you help? Well, you've all got opportunities to influence your stakeholders, help them understand how the vision of the business and the focus of the executives has to be on customer centricity, but also help them understand how they can lead it without trying to control it. You've got to help them understand how can they put customers at the center of everything, help them understand that strategy is about priorities. You've got to think about what really differentiates you. You know, I meet with many customers who think investing in this technology or this ARP or this or that will help them be more cost efficient, but certainly not transformational. There are so many things an organization can go after. It has to make priorities, and that's probably reflected in the business strategy, but has to be working backwards from the customer. If you don't align your investments with those priorities, you're wasting resources on things that are non-differentiating. Help demonstrate, show people how small empowered teams working with customers can reinvent and what you learn from that so that over time that becomes a competency and you can scale it pervasively through your whole organization. So, so I always talk about start small, think big, but go fast. And I think the thing to remember is as organizations feel that they've perfected the customer experience, the customer will never be satisfied. You know, they will always be prone to go after whoever is delivering a better experience. And in many organizations, one of the ways to do that is to actually disrupt yourself, which feels very frightening for executives. But if you don't do it, somebody will do it to, uh, to you. So look, I've really enjoyed the whole conference. I've really been delighted to listen to all the other presentations today. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I'll finish there. Thank you.